All right, you guys, so I am doing, like I said, Thomas Paine's Common Sense. So I'm going to start with what he talked about when he talked about religion. And basically, sorry, I'm trying to live stream this and kind of record it for my YouTube also. So there we go. So basically, I'm going to start with religion, stuff I found in this pamphlet. It's like I've said before, this book was a compilation, I think, of pamphlets, if I read that right, and that he produced to lay out the reasoning for what government should do, what it shouldn't be in the business of, how far government should do something, that we should be our own individual and unique um, country and why it should be done now, things like that. So I'm not going to read everything. It's very long. Well, it's not very long. It's like 52 pages. But everyone should read it because it's very concise and it gets down to the point. So religion, his first point that I thought was interesting and conveys an idea. So this one is, this new world has been the asylum for the persecuted lovers of civil and religious liberty from every part of Europe. Here have they fled, not from the tender embraces of the mother, but from the cruelty of the monster. And it is so far true of England that the same tyranny which drove the first immigrants from home pursues their descendants still. So this idea here is that um, one of the reasons America was founded was for religious liberty so that someone could practice their religion in peace. So it's going to take me a couple seconds to find the next one. Let's see. It's not telling me the page numbers. Okay, so I'm looking for page 32. Come on, turn the page. I have a lot of these highlighted to help me uh, read it. Let's see if I can find this thing. Page 32. And my next one is this. Securing freedom and property to all men and above all things, the free exercise of religion according to the dictates of conscience. That's what he thinks uh, government's for. Just that, securing freedom and property to all men, and above all things, the free exercise of religion, according to the dictates of conscience. So it's a bit, it was a big deal to them. It's not wasn't something that was just, you know, oh, it, it's a byproduct. It was the thing that they thought about. So let's see, page forty, I believe is what I'm on next. Yep, page forty. It says, let's see. I gotta find uh, my thing. Burp. Now I can't find it. See, there's another page, uh, another page 40. <laughs> no. Oh, okay, so I'll just read this next one. All right. So, this is the last one. I think this is the, the best one, really, for it. It says, For myself, I fully and conscientiously believe that it is the will of the Almighty that there should be diversity of religious opinions among us. It affords a larger field for our Christian kindness. Were we all of one way of thinking, our religious dispositions would want matter for probation. And on this liberal principle, I look on the various denominations among us to be like children of the same family, differing only in what is called their Christian names. And then the next one here says, A charter is to be understood as a bond of solemn obligation, which the whole enters into to support the right of every separate part, whether of religion, personal freedom, or property. A firm bargain and a right reckoning make long friends. So religion, you being free to practice your religion according to your conscience, is, was a big deal. It wasn't something that was just sort of tossed, that was just sort of extra on top of that. It was a big deal. Oh, I can't find it to be. There's a quote in here that's, I hold, it, I hold this to be the only thing that government 
that government should oh that's because it's in here here it is as to religion i hold it to be the indispensable duty of all government to protect all conscientious professors thereof and i know of no other business which government hath to do therewith so basically saying he believes the government should excuse me uphold our ability to follow our faith and speaking of Christian faith because mostly that's what that's what people were and you saw in the other quote where he's talking about our Christian uh, names were all the same children of you know Jesus just under different names so um, that's mainly what he was thinking of when it came to religion they were thinking about the Christian religion now this just happens to coincide with or happens to help out people who have other religions but that was the basis. It wasn't like uh, they were thinking, well, I want some Hindu sheiks in here. They were thinking mostly about Christians because this was a nation built on many different types of Christians. So my next one. So this intro here, what I thought was very important because it has to do sort of with what things, how things are going now, where if something is uh, fashionable, then we think it's right, or if something is, um, if something is popular, we think we have to think that way. The social justice warriors are that way. If you have to think this way, you have to think that way. So this is something that's going on right now, and it's applicable to what we're seeing. So here it is. Perhaps the sentiments contained in the following pages are not yet sufficiently fashionable to procure them general favor, aka they're not popular. A long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right and raises at first a formidable outcry in defense of custom. So basically, just because you don't think it's wrong, then it's sort of like, well, it must be right then. And people start to say, well, I'm not going to think differently just because I've thought a different way the whole time. But the tumult soon subsides. Time makes more converts than reason. So that's something that's going on right now. And I think as conservatives who are jumping into and trying to change the culture of America, that is something we need to remember. Time makes more converts than reason. Another way that you can put that is if you hear it enough, you'll just think it's right. And that is something that people have used for years and years and years. I just happen to think it is actually right. And we should teach the, we should teach the correct um, base theology or base. Um, oh, I'm trying to think of a phrase. But we should teach the, it, the stuff that's right all the time. People should hear what's right so that they can tell what's wrong. So. Okay, so the next one where he talks about, this is where he's talking about generally like why we should be a free nation, how he views America, or how he views government. Okay, it falls into one of those three. So this, this is, I think, one of the ones that how he views, views America. The cause of America is in a great measure the cause of all mankind. Many circumstances have and will arise which are not local but universal, and through which the principles of all lovers of mankind are affected and in the event of which their affections are interested. So basically what he's saying is America is a proving and testing ground for all kinds of things. People will look to us because we're trying to be the most free to see how it works. And so far it's worked pretty well. What has happened is people have jumped in and taken it and tried to take it over. So the next one Is I think the next chapter. Okay, so this one's actually good, I think. But I don't think I wrote it down. Okay, anyway, I'm going to read it anyway. It says Some writers have so confounded society with government as to leave little or no distinction between them, whereas they are not only different but have different origins. Society is produced by our wants, government by our wickedness. 
The former pr promotes our positively by uniting our affections, the latter negatively by restraining our vices. The one encourages discourse, the other creates distinctions, the first a patron, the last a punisher. Society in every state is a blessing, but government, even in, it, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil. In its worst state, an intolerable one. For even when we suffer or are exposed to the same miseries by a government, which we might expect in a country without government, our calamity is heightened by reflecting that we fur furnish the means by which we suffer. So what he's basically saying here is that is is sort of the free market idea where if we're left to our own devices what we will basically do generally speaking is we will conduct you know exchanges I'll buy your bread you'll come to my store and buy my toys for your children things like that naturally of our own and then things will flow naturally from there if we don't need if we don't have kids, we don't need toys anymore, then my toy store goes away. And I have to think of something else to do. And that's just naturally how it happens. So, but then he says, but government comes in only because someone steals from my toy store. Or someone burns down the bread guy's place. <laughs> okay. That's why, and that's why it is necess it's a necessary evil because we create government or we have a sheriff in order that we can punish, how do you put it, our vices, restrain our vices. So government in itself is, is created for a negative. So it's not good anyway, and that's how he viewed it. And that's kind of, that's the, how I view it as well. And this, he continues, government, like dress, is the badge of lost innocence. The palaces of kings are built on the ruins of the bowers of paradise. So what we basically say here is that as you create government, you create a place where people will become less and less free. So... And you can see that as they as governments go on. So, my next point, point number three, where he's talking about, I believe this is talking about government. But as the colony increases, the public concerns will increase likewise, and the distance at which the members may be separated will render it too inconvenient for all of them to meet on every occasion, as at first when their number was small, their habitations near, and the public concerns few and trifling. This will point out the convenience of their consenting to leave the legislative part to be managed by a select number of chosen from the whole body, who are supposed to have the same concerns at stake which those who appointed them, and who will act in the same manner as the whole body would act, were they present. So this is the basic idea behind the government we have now where we elect congressmen and house representatives and we elect presidents and everything because they're supposed to go and meet in here somewhere he says they meet like once a year and that's all that's the that's the extent of how they should meet but then he talks about so what he's saying is that these are supposed to be regular people people who are chosen from the body from the people and they're supposed to have the same concerns as the people. And when they leave, their laws apply to them and things, things that we don't have now. He goes on to say that the elected might never form to themselves an interest separate from the electors. So where we have now, we have special interest groups and all these other things. That's not how it was supposed to go. And that's not how they thought of government whenever they first started it. So, the next, I have uh, number four. Prudence will point out the propriety of having elections often, because as the elected might by that means return and mix again with the general body of electors in a few months, their fidelity to the public will be secured by the prudent reflection of not making a rod for themselves, 
And as this frequent interchange will establish a common interest with every part of the community. So basically what he's saying here is that our representatives, our house, you know, people, all of that, all of these people who are supposed to represent us and make a decision for us are not supposed to stay in there for years and years and years. That's not what it's about. We, what they're supposed to do is return to the general public and mix amongst us. The laws that they make apply to them. The things that they do apply to them just like it applies to everyone else. You have to come out and live with the people that you made a law for. So you better be sure that it's right. So point number five. Let's see if I can find it. Okay. I draw my idea of the form of government from a principle in nature, which no art can overturn, that the more simple anything is, the less liable it is to be disordered and the easier repaired when disordered. And you see this too. If you only have two, I uh, use a sandwich. A sandwich, a good sandwich, a perfect sandwich only has like maybe four ingredients. And it's savory, savory, it's the bread, the savory, the meat, and then maybe a cheese. Why? Because if you get too many like lettuce, tomato, pickles, you get too much stuff on there, it falls apart, it falls out. You have to use a different kind of bread, which then, then there's more bread, etc. Perfect balance is usually simplicity. And so this is exactly what he's talking about for the government, too. Sorry, hold on. I dropped my stuff. Okay. When he's talking about the government, too. If our government isn't large, it's easier to repair when it goes wrong. And this is what we're running into now, where our government is so big, it's hard to do anything about it. And where were they first design government that's not what they designed it for so this is something you can see here in their writing point number six how came the king by a power which the people are afraid to trust and always obligated to check such a power cannot be the gift of a wise people neither can any power which needs checking be from god yet the provision which the constitution makes supposes such a power to exist excuse me, but the provision is unequal to the task. So here is the part where you see this is, this is talking about where they're trying to pull away from England. And I found it fascinating because what he's doing is saying, how, how is it that a man, any man has, is given power and trust and everything else over another man? It's not, it's not something that God designed. It's not natural. It's not the way it should be. Where do kings get these things? So, like, right now everybody thinks, oh, the president is such a big guy. Like, I don't care. I, I do care because people have taken, like, the presidency and said, okay, now I can just rule, fiat rule, and I can start writing things, and it just is. But the president is not supposed to be that big of a guy. They wanted this, at least this person here, wanted government to be of the people quite literally where you take Joe over there and he goes to Congress today and elects and makes a vote for you and then he comes back and they believed that this kind of power that where like a king doesn't come from God it's just it's a something we created and it's not good so See if I can find point number seven. Yes. All right. So here he says, but there is another and greater distinction for which no truly natural or religious reason can be assigned. And that is the distinction of men into kings and subjects. Male and female are the distinction, distinctions of nature, good and bad, the distinctions of heaven. But how a race of men came into the world so exalted above the rest and distinguished like some new species is worth inquiring into and whether they are the means of happiness or of misery to mankind. So here he is again questioning the, you know, the separation of people from rulers to subjects. We're kind of going this way in America and I don't like it because people leave senators and they leave House of Representatives and they, they leave all these people in for years and years and years and it just becomes like, well, he's supposed to take care of me. Why? Why would that be the case when 
It's, it's never been the case before. These are distinctions and divisions that aren't good. They're not natural, he says. They're not, they're not distinctions made by God. Where did these come from? Okay. So that's not how they want us separated. I'm Jane Joe Blow. I can go and be part of the Senate. It's not supposed to take, like, people nowadays go to school for this stuff. They gather a lot of money. It's not supposed to be about all that, as you can see in these writings that he makes. Let's see if I can find my next one. <laughs> Should be on page 18. And it's not. Oh, yeah, there it is. I just couldn't see it. So here he's talking again. Men who look upon themselves born to reign and others to obey soon grow insolent. Selected from the rest of mankind, their minds are early poisoned by importance. And the world they act in differs so materially from the world at large that they have but little opportunity of knowing its true interest. And when they succeed to the government, are frequently the most ignorant and unfit of any throughout the dominions. Once again, you can see this now, where we have, whether you're a liberal or you're a conservative, you see both sides, and you see, you see them both, and they're like, totally out of touch with what the people want, with how the people are, are going through. It's because, for some reason, people nowadays have this idea that these guys are like kings and queens, or dukes or duchesses or something, in the level of importance in their life, and they're not. These people that are in here have been there for so long that they don't, their minds are poisoned by importance. The world that they act in differs so materially from the world at large, you know, what we go through every day, that they have little opportunity to know the true interests. And that's what we see here today. So my next one, my next one page 21. Let's see if I can get over there right quick. What is this? Okay, page 21. The sun, I think. Yes. The sun never shined on a cause of greater worth. Now here he's talking about America being separate and having her own uh, leaders and everything. The sun never shined on a cause of greater worth. Tis not the affair of a city, a county, a province, or a kingdom, but of a continent of at least one-eighth part of the habitable globe. Tis not the concern of a day, a year, or an age. Posterity are virtually involved in the contest, and we be more or less affected even to the end of time by the proceedings now. The least fracture now will be like a name engraved on the point of a pen, on the tender rind of young oak. The wound will enlarge with the tree. So what he's saying here, in the first part, is that it's more what happens now for America echoes forever. Us as Americans being Americans and not British uh, run. We're not Britons, we're Americans. And he says that it's important because for the rest of time, even to the end of time, what happens here will change the world. And it did. It does still. We're still up there. So, the last part is if you have a fracture in this country, you have division. Just like a little a little mar on an oak tree, it'll, it will kill and divide this nation. And that is what some people want. Some people want to kill and divide the nation. It's not what I want. But you can see that they were thinking about these things. These were what is happening now was not known then. They knew that these things could happen. And they tried to, I think, do something about it by writing about this stuff. All right, my next one. There's only like four more here. I'm, I gotta find my thing. Okay. Nope, no, that's not it. Hmm. I'm going to go on to the next one. I don't see it. Okay. I mean not to exhibit horror for the purpose of provoking revenge, but to awaken us from fatal and unmanly slumbers, that we may pursue determinately some fixed object, 
it is not in the power of Britain or of Europe to conquer America if she do not conquer herself by delay and timidity. So what he's, what he's like for, for context, he's talking here about, we need to act now. We need to be a separate sovereign nation now and not later because then we may not get the chance. We need to be focused on this fixed object of liberty so that we can become the great nation that we want to become. And so that for them, that's what this was. This is, this wasn't, um, well, we just want to be, you know, free to practice our religion. It wasn't just that. They saw the ability to be wholly free. And I don't know anyone who wouldn't want that. What do you guys think? Got to find the next one. Sorry. Well, this one's also interesting. Talking about kings and religion. But where, says some, is the king of America? I tell you, friend, he reigns above and does not make havoc of mankind like the royal brute of Britain. So here we go once again, reference to God, reference to being, reference to him being the one that is causing most of this to happen, giving us the ability to go out and become a sovereign nation. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> All right. Here, here he says, O oh, ye that love mankind, you that dare oppose not only tyranny, but the tyrant, stand. Every spot of the old world is overrun with oppression. Freedom has been hunted around the globe. Asia and Africa have long expelled her. Europe regards her like a stranger. And England has given her a warning to depart. Receive the fugitive and prepare in time an asylum for mankind. And this is how he views America, an asylum for mankind, to receive the fugitive of someone who runs to find freedom. And so this is why freedom is such a compelling thing in America. We see freedom, we see our ability to worship as we would, and things like that. So it's more, it's, oh my goodness. <laughs> Sorry, hold on, let me see if I can. If I can turn that off for a second. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so it's more about freedom and the next, the freedom to worship. So freedom just in general from taxation, from government, from not being able to like, like even move because I think the taxation was so crazy in England at the time. And we are getting there. And this is the thing that worries me is we're not remembering the past where we're about to slide right into it again. So when I say I don't want the government to do it, it's because a lot of the times there's already laws in the books where the government already is doing it. We don't need more. And because we initially came here to live as free people or freemen, as they said. So we're not heavily taxed. We're not sending people up there who stay there for years and years and make decisions for us. We wanted to be able to make free exchange between people and not have a middle man. So every time someone says, should the government, that's why my answer is always no. <laughs> because most likely one, they've already done it. And two, no, it's not what we were designed with or in mind. So he's got a couple more about um, the the nature of ideas and man, which I thought were interesting. Now let's see if I can find them. <laughs> let's see. Okay, this one I just thought was nice. Of more worth is one honest man to society and in the sight of God than all the crowned ruffians that ever lived. So what he's saying, I think here is to the point. I think everyone can understand what he's saying here. I don't think it's, um, I even think, yeah, I think you can get it. So let's see if I can find the next one. Page 30. I just skimmed right by it. No, I don't think that's it. 
thought I found something. Okay, here we go. Where there are no distinctions, there can be no superiority. Perfect equality affords no temptation. Now, he's not talking about what we see now where you have to pay women the same. I don't believe in the wage gap. It's not, it's not a thing. Um, that you have to, you know, make sure women's basketball is equally as has enough has the same amount of money as men's basketball even though they're boring and don't do as much say hello to my husband who's coming in here hi say hello to the people hi so what this is saying is there can't be superiority where our people who go and they make these when they vote for us these people cannot consider themselves higher than us better than us they need to be us they need to be the people who go. If you work in a in a office and there are ten of you, each of you should go one at a time to be the person who votes for us. It's not a career. It's not something you get paid for because in none of this do they mention a salary. It's a duty to make sure that we are all free is for all of us. Even if you don't agree with the guy down the road, it's freedom for all of us. It's our refuge in America. It's freedom. And so you can see that in their writings. It's very heavily there. Let me see if I can find the next one. Oh, here, here it is. Okay. This would be my last point. The Almighty has implanted in us these unextinguishable feelings for good and wise purposes. They are the guardians of his image in our hearts. They distinguish us from the herd of common animals. So this desire for freedom, this desire to come together and work together, even though it may not be the best idea for us or whatever, th these things, um, wanting to be free, I think, is mainly what he's talking about here. The, and he, the way he phrases this is the Almighty has implanted in us these unextinguishable feelings for good and wise purposes. He's saying that God put into man this desire, this passion, this burning to be free and that it is good and wise. What, so on the opposite side, what, is, what does that mean? That means people wanting to make laws to restrain you at every step is not wise and is not good. That's not what God placed in the heart of man. What God placed in the heart of man is freedom. And that's basically where I want to end this video. Thank you so much for joining me. If you have anything to say, you can at me on Twitter or you can just comment on my YouTube or whichever. Send me an email. I don't care. If you like the video, share it. And until tomorrow, guys, I will see you later. Remember to read your Bible and pray. Bye.